Hello everyone and welcome to the Insider's Guide to Renting in New York City presented by Street Easy. You are welcome to submit questions at any time using the questions pane of the control panel. And if your computer speaker system isn't working, try selecting telephone in the audio pane to dial in via phone. And just as a note, today's webinar is being recorded. I'd now like to introduce your host, Street Easy's Director of Marketing and Communications, Lauren Rifflin. Go ahead, Lauren. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. In case you already forgot, I'm Lauren and I oversee communications at Street Easy. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you and your family are safe and comfortable wherever you're tuning in from. I'm usually, of course, welcoming you all in person. This year, we were gearing up for a number of in-person events for renters, but as it did for everyone, our reality shifted pretty quickly. We were determined to still bring you timely resources and information about how to navigate the New York City rental market, so we paused to take some time to figure out how we could do that virtually. And here we are. I'm coming to you from my little corner on the Upper West Side in New York City for Street Easy's first virtual event dedicated to New York City renters. We have a packed agenda for the next hour. We've gathered a great panel of local leaders and experts who will be discussing local renters' rights and protections, how to safely navigate the market right now amidst COVID, and answer your questions. A recording of the program will be sent to attendees after via email, and it'll also be available on the Street Easy blog one block over. Before we get started, a few quick reminders. We'll have, uh, we'll have a couple of live audience polls throughout the program. They'll pop right up on your screen and allow you to select an answer. We'll also have Q&A with all of our speakers at the very end, so make sure to submit your, your questions at any point during the program using the question pane on the GoToWebinar panel. All right, that is enough for me. Let's get into it. I'd like to welcome our economist, Nancy Wu, up to the screen. Nancy, you can introduce yourself and then walk us through some of the latest research and trends Street Easy is seeing in the New York City rental market. Nancy, take it away. All right, hi everybody, and thank you for being here today. My name is Nancy Wu, and I I'm excited to be an economist and also a renter during this time, and I'm excited to share with you guys some of the data and tools to help you navigate the market. So before we get started, I would like to start with a poll and just ask you guys, I'm curious what you guys think, has COVID-19 so far made you consider moving to another neighborhood? And for those of you who are not New Yorkers, but are moving to New York City, has COVID-19 made you consider more neighborhood options? So I'll give you guys a few seconds to respond. And in New York City, I'm asking this because we're always facing the trade-off between commute time and affordability. But now with COVID-19, a lot of us are going to be working from home temporarily or more than five days a week or fewer than five days a week over the next few months slash the time being. So I'm curious to see if that has impacted anyone's options for where they're considering to look. So that being said, let's see the responses. Interesting. So a lot of you guys have not changed your preferences and many have also considered moving to other neighborhoods. That's really interesting. So there's a quite a diverse set of responses here. And that being said, I wanted to jump into the rentals market data to talk more in detail about some of these trends that we're seeing across boroughs and also just some history about what is going on in the state of the rentals market. So I'll start off with some background on how the market has been behaving. And we'll start off with some context on where we are in the market. So these are the median asking prices on TreeEasy as of May 2020. So half of the homes that you'll see on TreeEasy were listed for above these prices and the other half below for these boroughs. And it's important to keep in mind that these are the median asking rents. So what landlords are advertising on Street Easy is not necessarily what you'll be paying because asking rents on Street Easy tend to be higher due to price cuts and negotiations being very common in New York City. So that's something that's good to keep in mind and to stay informed in order to be able to negotiate. And our goal here is to give you the data in order to do that. All right, so the ultimate question is, when will rents fall, if ever? 
Leading into COVID-19, New York City rents have reached all-time highs and they were still growing rapidly at record rates. So we're looking now at the rate at which rents are growing year over year. The Street Easy Rent Index is this tool that Street Easy has created to look at how rents are changing over time. So we trace repeat rentals or rentals coming onto the market more than twice and we see how those rents have been changing over time in order to help us control for location, for a number of bedrooms, et cetera. And it's a better way of looking at changes in rents over time than medians where we can't control for all of those variables. So this looks at year on year change. And as of May, 2020, we saw that rents have not yet dropped, though they have been slowing down a lot. So they're not growing at rapid rates like five or 3% year over year anymore, but they haven't dropped yet either. And we may see that there's many early signs that rents will drop soon, and it's a good time to be looking as a renter. So even though rents haven't really moved yet, we are seeing that rent cuts have been increasing. And what a rent cut is, is a advertised discount on Street Easy for a rent drop. So more rent drops and bigger rent drops are early signs of falling demand. And there are early predictors that rents will fall in the coming months, and many of you guys on the market have already begun to see that. So let's break it down to the borough level and compare. We've seen that over 26% of rentals on, in Manhattan have had a rent cut in May. That's huge, and that's a huge increase from last year. They've also increased in Brooklyn and Queens, but not by as much as they have in Manhattan. And rent cuts fell in Bronx and Staten Island. So when I asked that first poll, I was curious to see if the situation has made you guys consider moving to other neighborhoods, other boroughs, maybe boroughs outside of Manhattan. And because we see that during periods of economic uncertainty, like right now, a lot of renters like you guys may be inclined to trade that easy commute to Manhattan in favor of saving money. And that could often mean moving to another borough. So right now we are seeing lower demand in Manhattan due to landlords having to offer so many more rent cuts in order to incentivize renters than they have in the past. So with so many discounts on the market, we wanna know what does the market have in terms of choices? And rental inventory, new rental listings coming onto the market every week, fell slightly, fell by a lot after coronavirus hit the city, but they've since recovered dramatically. And there are many choices for you guys on the market right now. And these will keep growing over the next few months as we hit the summer seasons. So there's relatively more rental options right now then there is demand, which means it's a really good time to negotiate and find a good deal. Speaking of negotiation, let's talk a little bit about broker fees. For those of you who haven't rented in New York City before, a broker fee is something that you have to pay to the broker that lists the apartment. It can be one month's rent or 12 to 15% of your annual rent. And now this isn't on every apartment. We see that over 55% of rental listings on Street Easy last year were listed as no fees. But a lot of those buildings and apartments that are no fee are going to be newer buildings and they're often sometimes more expensive than apartments with fees. So it's a good idea to look for both and to consider all your options. But if you are looking at apartments with broker fees, it's important to know that a broker fee is 100% negotiable, but Street Easy did a survey that found 66% of renters didn't negotiate. So that's something else to keep in mind to make sure to negotiate on your broker fee as well as your rent. That being said, with so many choices and a lot of time to spend in your apartment, I wanted to ask another question. Has spending more time at home amid the pandemic shifted what you look for in an apartment? So do you guys look for more space or more in-unit amenities such as laundry and a dishwasher? Do you guys care more about outdoor space? So there are a lot of options here to look into. So that being said, let's see the results. Wow, so yeah, a lot of you guys want all of the above, which totally makes sense because there are outdoor space is so rare and that is great to be able to have in your apartment so you can go outside in unit amenities and space in general. So let's look into some of the preferences that we've been seeing. And keeping in mind that all of these amenities do come with a cost in New York City that is often large, but on Street Easy, you can actually customize your search and choose the amenities that you want to look at when you're filtering for apartments. So not only do we keep an eye on the economy and rents, 
Look, we've also been looking into user behavior and how renter preferences and priorities are changing during coronavirus. So in May 2019, last year, the most searched for amenity were pets, because that's kind of a deal breaker. If you have a pet, then you need a pet friendly apartment. But this year, the most commonly searched for amenity was in unit laundry. So a lot of people want that laundry. And for those of you who are moving to New York, which I know a lot of you guys are not yet in the city, it is true that in-unit laundry is a bit of a luxury in New York City. And there are so many apartments that have laundry in building or you have to go to a laundromat, but it is a very desirable in-unit amenity currently due to the situation. And we're also seeing that elevators and doormans, these shared amenities are becoming slightly less popular while outdoor space is becoming more popular. So you guys are right on point about which amenities are important to you. And that being said, a lot of those amenities come in, come with a price. And the big question now is how could COVID-19 impact rents? Will rents go down? Will these apartments become more affordable? And how much will rents drop? A lot of these questions we simply don't know the answer to yet, but we can do some, some of our takeaways here and give you guys the tips for how to navigate the market. So the takeaway from all of these slides on the market is that renters, you all might see even more rent cuts in the coming months and rents could fall even more in the summer due to an increase in supply and a decrease in demand. So a lot of leases will be expiring in the summer months because that's how the rental seasonality works in the city. And a lot of New Yorkers are leaving the city temporarily right now, which increases the vacancy rates. A lot of New Yorkers are new hires and summer interns coming into the city to begin their jobs, and they'll be starting their jobs from home. So all of that being said, there's going to be less demand and more supply in the summer months, which could lead to more rent cuts and rent drops, especially in Manhattan, in studios, because people want more space, and in larger buildings with shared amenities like gyms that people don't want to pay for right now because they are under social distancing orders. So the ultimate impact really depends on several factors, and it's important to keep in mind that rents do fall, during the Great Recession, rents fell by 10% due to higher vacancy rates from unemployment. We simply don't know if that economic fallout from this pandemic will be comparable, but we do know that the impacts on employment and income loss will be large. So almost 1.5 million people or a third of the city's wage earners may be at risk of income loss from COVID-19. And we know from an economic perspective that the creation of jobs is a really essential factor for the strength of the rentals market. In a strong economy, people move to the city for work. And in a weaker economy with higher unemployment, people move out of the city, resulting in higher vacancy rates and therefore lower rents. So I wanted to end with some optimism and say that New York City is extremely resilient. From 2009, right after the Great Recession to February 2020, New York City has experienced the largest and longest job expansion since the end of World War II. So that means a lot of you guys will be able to move to the city and you know during that expansion rents also increased a lot so right now is actually a really good time to be looking on the market and to move to new york city and see the city come back to life again so the best thing you can do right now is to inform yourself with as many sources as possible and i want to empower you guys to do that with this free tool that we have you can check it out on stradizi.com blog data dash dashboard and it gives you the opportunity to personalize the data all of those metrics that I talked about earlier, to zoom in on specific neighborhoods and stay informed. You can do this for sales and rentals if you're considering buying potentially, and just look at all the factors and areas that are important to you. And we also offer a wealth of resources on our blog page, which has all of the stories in depth of the research that I discussed. And you can also follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn to stay updated. And now I will turn it over to Lauren. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Nancy. So that was just a little bit of information for, for all of you. Um, don't worry, as I said before, there will be a recording of this um, and we'll also post, post the slides. Um, and there is a lot of research. Uh, Nancy's used a lot of that data to create unique stories um, and research pieces that are also posted on the blog. So no pressure to memorize the incredibly uh, dense amount of information that we uh, uh, that we just walked you through. Um, 
Now we're going to shift from the data to talk about the actual shopping process and how to navigate it um, and also hear from a couple of experts um, who will also talk to us about the renter protections and renter rights that are incredibly important for New York City renters to be familiar with. Uh, before we jump into the discussion though, I'm going to pop up our next poll, um, which is our, which is phase two inspired. So um, New York City just entered phase two of our reopening, which includes um, real estate activities. So uh, wanted to gauge, um, gauge with the audience just how comfortable folks are um, with actually touring in person. So how likely are you to tour apartments in person versus continuing to tour apartments virtually? Uh, we're certainly during the shutdown, it was a, a, a massive uptick of, of virtual, um, but, but everybody kind of has different, different preferences on whether or not they're comfortable touring in person. Um, of course, there's a pretty extensive list of um, of protocols and mandates from the state to ensure both customers, renters, and, um, and agents, and landlords, everybody involved are, are safe, um, but touring uh, apartments in person is, um, is an option. Um, let me take a peek and see how many of you have responded. That's pretty good. Uh, let's go ahead and show, and show those results. Um, so this is encouraging also to, to be expected. It's so new, um, so somewhat likely, um, but still a lot of people are unsure. Um, so that's entirely understandable. Um, hopefully you'll come away with uh, this next part of the conversation uh, with a lot more information on, on how to navigate the, the rental search with the public health precautions um, in place. With that, I'd like to bring up our, our, two, our two panelists, our two guests, um, New York State Senator Brian Benjamin and Mike Barilla from Compass. Um, if you guys want to go ahead and turn on your cameras and join me. Hey there, hey, Mike. Good morning. How are you? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, of course. And we'll Actually, uh, the senator is joining us shortly. I'm actually gonna um, gonna give us give us a little bit of time to have you introduce yourself. So, Mike, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about um, your your expertise and how long you've you've been in in the real estate game. Sure, happy to do so. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, having me here today. My name is Mike Barilla. I am a licensed real estate salesperson at Compass. Um, I specialize in residential real estate throughout the city of Manhattan and the surrounding boroughs. I have had experience representing buyers, sellers, and of course, renters and landlords. I have been in real estate for a little over six years now, and the majority of my business, the first several years I started in real estate, was specifically working with renters throughout the entire city. So I am well versed in um, all the intricacies of the rental process. I've done anything from a five flight studio walk up all the way to ultra luxury high end rentals. And uh, it's it's a very interesting time, and and I am happy that Nancy did end her note with some optimism because I do think that as we start unveiling phase two and things get back into a little bit of normalcy, I do think that New York City is going to have a really strong rebound. Great. Actually, before um, before I let you go out of your intro, I did um, really really quickly. Um, I talked about what phase two was, but can you walk through um, what it actually means? for real estate for everybody listening? Yeah, absolutely. So phase two, um, it actually reopened real estate brokerages as an essential service. So throughout phase one, real estate agents were not considered essential. So we were not allowed to show property. So any transactions or moves that were occurring during those times through phase one was all sight unseen and the policies on every building, it was a case by case. So it's been interesting to see how all the different buildings are adjusting now that we are officially in phase two 
And now that real estate is considered an essential service, they are allowing showings. But uh, once again, like I said, there are several new restrictions. And dependent upon the type of building that you are pursuing, there will be different guidelines. So it's very important that moving forward, before you go to see a property, that you do that research to know uh, if you can see in person, how many people can attend, and the proper precautions that you need to take in order to see that property. Great, great, thank you very, very much. Every, I mean, every every state, um, every state has a different, a little bit of a different meaning for what um, their their stages of um, a reopening a reopening looks like. Um, and while, yeah, uh, and so while um, while we um, while we wait for the senator, actually, it makes it pretty easy to to transition into um, into navigating this, navigating the the shopping experience. Um, so I'd like to I'd like to start the conversation with you, Mike, um, and ask something that we have heard so so much um whether it's our street easy social channels or the blog um or even personally to be honest um so talk to me about what's what's changed about the apartment hunt with social distance safeguards in place um and what really touring apartments looks like right now um for open houses and touring yeah, absolutely. So I will go over both of the virtual process and the in-person process. So for the in-person process, now they have implemented some new guidelines and restrictions based upon whether or not the apartment is through a real estate board represented property. So if you are going to see a property that is represented through a brokerage, the Real Estate Board of New York, which is the overlying company that guides and has the guidelines set in place for how real estate is transacted in New York. So if you're going to see a physical property that is represented by a Rebney represented agent, you have to now fill out two Rebney guidelines forms prior to them even giving you permission. Now these two forms are a health screening questionnaire, which is just the basic questions of the obvious, you know, the different types of, uh, the word I'm looking for, the symptoms of what Corona has. So basically yep. temperature, if you've been exposed to anyone in the recent couple of weeks that may have been uh, positive for Corona, um, things of that nature. And they also have a limitation of liability form, which basically states that, you know, if you do contract it or anything, it just basically is a waiver to give them no liabilities for exposure to Corona. So it can be a little discerning if you see something like that sent to you, but just understand that that is a standard practice. So when you do receive these forms, um, don't be alarmed. It's just part of the process if you are willing to take that step to see things in person. Another sure, thing that- A super quick, super quick follow-up um, to clarify, those are forms that the agent will send to the renter, not ones they need to find online themselves. That's absolutely correct, Lauren. So okay. prior to seeing the property, the real estate agent will send you both of these forms and they must be signed and sent back prior to them giving you access to the apartment. Got it. And does, um, does that a, a, new, a new form needs to be signed with each tour or is it you signed a waiver for all tours and you're golden? So that's kind of the funny part about these new guidelines coming out. It's kind of a new thing that we're all learning how the process mm -hmm. is going to play out. So yep. there's actually a column where you can put the property that you're viewing. So dependent upon if you're going to see multiple properties with multiple brokers, you may have to fill out that form separately or we're seeing some agents put the, the list of properties that they're going to be seeing and send that over as well. So it kind of just puts it all okay. in one, one picture to make it a lot simpler. Okay, that, that makes sense. Um, perfect. We're all learning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, what, we're, phase two just started on, on Monday. So we're, 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 all, we're all new, we're, we're all new it, here. It's, it's um, real estate, you gotta roll with the punches, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I mean, if anything, renters should be encouraged to ask ask the agents questions. Um, there are no stupid questions 
life motto, but um, particularly I better myself. <laughs> Um, a few other things I did want to touch base on, if I do yes. have a few moments. Of so if, if you are seeing property in person, one of the things that I always recommend, since this is kind of a new uncertainty and there's so many different ways that each agent is, is going to handle their properties, if you are concerned, reach out to the broker and ask them what precautions that they're taking prior to having clients come view the property. So for example, I have what's called a COVID kit that I have in all of my exclusive properties, which contains Lysol disinfectant wipes. If they're gonna be touching doorknobs and there are other tenants that are coming in and out, so we have that on hand. I also have masks, I have booties as well, the little slip-ons that go over your shoes, um, because mm -hmm. we do know New York City streets, they, uh, they can contract a lot of things. Uh, a few other things, I, um, I definitely think it's very important now that we're starting the search process again, that you only bring the necessary parties that need to see the property. So if it's you and a spouse, you, you should be the only two people coming. I know people get excited, they're moving to New York City, they want their friends and their families to see their new apartments. Unfortunately, with everything going on, this is not the time to do so. So just bring the necessary people and you know take pictures and send it to them and hopefully once normalcy resumes, they can come see it after. But just to, to give less of a liability and less people interacting in person, I highly recommend just the necessity. Great. And so our um, our open our open houses a thing, um, or is it strictly what you're seeing in these first couple of days? Strictly, you know, by by appointment only. So correct. So right now, basically every building is case by case, but for overall open houses and Revni is also pushing this as well. They're strictly prohibited. It's just an uncertainty of how many people will show up. It's too early to you know, potentially have that kind of risk. So right now, open houses um, are strictly prohibited. Showings are by appointment. And I think that that's gonna be the going trend for a while. It's, people are nervous and with all, with all justifiable reasons. So it should take a little bit of time before people feel more comfortable having, you, you know, you've been to an open house in New York, I'm sure. I've had some where 30 parties yeah. have walked through in an hour. So we're not there yet. It's gonna take some time. Yep, that makes sense. Um, great. So now um, I want to talk a little bit about the process of signing a new lease and moving into the actual apartment. Um, can, uh, can, can you tell me a little bit about what has changed about the moving process amidst COVID? Of course. So interestingly enough, throughout this entire thing, Movers in New York City were actually considered essential during phase one. So now that we're moving into phase two, movers are still considered essential. So it's going to be a bit more business as usual for the movers. Uh, huh. Something that I, I very much recommend that some people know is when you're moving into a building in New York City, it is very important that the movers that you do hire have a valid certificate of insurance that they must present to the managing agent prior to them moving into the property. So this is gonna be basically the way to protect you in case any issues occur during the move. If a mover breaks something in the elevator, that certificate of insurance will cover that. And in New York, those liabilities for the certificate of insurance, it's usually a very, very high policy that the movers need to provide. So that just takes the liability off of you. And as far as the actual movers go, they need to abide by all of the same processes that the building has as far as preventative measures for having movers come in and out of the building. So if the building requires masks, if they require gloves, things of that nature, they have to abide by that as well. So make sure whichever mover you do use, that they're also in the, in the know of, listen, you need a glove, you need masks, you have to have these things, otherwise, especially in doorman buildings, this is New York City, there are literal gatekeepers, they will not let them through the doors. Yeah, that's actually a really good, um, a really good point about, uh, about doorman buildings. 
Um, I mean, with with the I'm kind of asking a little bit of an off the cuff off the cuff off the cuff question, but um, even with the new protocols um, and state mandates in place, um, is there a difference between like will you still see differences between buildings on how they're how they're operating and allowing allowing tours um, or open houses? Absolutely. And that's the interesting thing about New York City that makes it so new, like so unique is New York has different independent representation for each building. So if mm -hmm. you're going into a, you know, I live in a high high end rental building called TF Cornerstone. So they represent over 15 to 20 buildings throughout the city. Now they have completely different rules and guidelines than some other buildings do. And there are 65% of the uh, buildings in New York are co-ops. And if you're moving into a rental co-op, which does exist, there's all different guidelines. So that's something else that's very important that when you do choose a building, you make sure that you understand what type of building you're moving into because every single building will have its own set of rules. And hopefully as we continue getting, you know, into deeper and deeper phases, there'll be a more uniform type of moving process. But as of right now, it's it's a case by case basis, and that's why I'm I'm such a proponent of ask the questions, do your research, talk to the landlords, know what you're getting yourself into. Great. And when um uh when, when you when you think about asking asking a question about what type of building, um, mm -hmm. I, what is what what it what is that question? Is it just hey are is is this building a co-op or a condo or what would you recommend for renters to ask to to get that information if it's not immediately offered great so one of the things i love about street easy is when you actually look at the address on the website you'll see right under the address so let's say it's 444 west 19th street on the listing you'll see right underneath it street easy actually will tell you which type of building it is if it's a co-op if it's a condo or if it's a strictly rental unit or a multifamily townhouse, you know, things of that nature. So check that. And if that doesn't answer the question, ask the broker. Say, listen, I saw that this property said condo. I wanted to see if there were any other restrictions as far as the moving process. And also if there are any other fees associated with this, this apartment in particular. Um awesome 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 like maybe uh, i maybe just inspired a inspired a blog post street easy team um take note we might need to have a um mike help us with a blog post about what what questions to ask Always um, i love it okay um let's um let's shift into um into our next topic um if we could actually go to the next slide renter rights and protections. Um, and with that, I'd also like to um, like to welcome New York State Senator, Senator Brian Benjamin, who's with us. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, this has been a, a very or a big ordeal getting onto this call. I apologize that I'm not there visually, but uh, you, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Um, all right. Yeah, yes, we no, can. no worries at all. Um, <laughs> We're we're so we're so happy to have you. Thanks for joining us. Um, and actually, bef before um, before we jump into the discussion, um, hopefully this is an easy first question. But I'd I'd love um, I'd love Senator if you could you could just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and um, all of the all the great work that you're doing for for New York. Well, sure. Well, thank you. And I I, I did enjoy listening to Mike. Very informative. Uh, if I needed to find an apartment, I'm definitely calling him. Um, but let me let me uh, say a couple things. Uh, I was, you know, I'm born and bred in Harlem. Um, uh, grew up in this community. Grew up in New York City. Uh, you know, went to uh, Catholic schools in New York City, and then I was fortunate enough to go off to Brown University, majoring in public policy and Harvard Business School, and and then I came back and did a few things. Um, uh, investment banking for a couple of years, built a, a lot of affordable housing in Harlem and New Jersey for a number of years before being elected. And so I have a sort of a range of experience in terms of uh, on the private Actually, side and, and on the public side. I just clicked that for him and I think came through. Hello? Yep, we still got you. Okay, sorry. 
So, uh, so I have been focusing on a couple of, uh, of things. As you can imagine right now, uh, during COVID, uh, there are a couple of key issues. One is, you know, when, when, first, when COVID first really took off in New York, uh, my district, which is Central Harlem, East Harlem, uh, and Upper West Side, but particularly the Central Harlem and, and East Harlem part of the district, were really hit pretty hard by COVID. And so I spent a lot of time trying to deal with issues around mitigating the spread, uh, making sure that we had uh, adequate testing sites and making sure that uh, we were um, getting PPE around, focusing on social distancing, all of those important things that you know are, are, are essential. We then, uh, on top of that, um, had to deal with a, a lot of the racial unrest around, around the George Floyd killing. And, and so there's a number of, of issues, police reform, and a number of important topics that I've been dealing with on that front. Uh, but last year, to bring this to where we are right now, last year, uh, the biggest conversation we were dealing with was our rental laws and making sure that we uh, sort of provided uh, safe uh, 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 opportunities for renters to to have a adequate um, opportunities to rental opportunities and to make sure that they weren't taken advantage by landlords. There were a number of 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 of, of, of sort of key provisions in a number of, uh, of of issues all tied into one bill. Uh, uh, that um, has really been groundbreaking in terms of how we dealt with rent, uh, rent reform. And so I'm happy to talk about some of that if, if that's of interest. But uh, one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that people, you know, who have been rent burdened for a while and just uh, and living in a city where so many people um, have a hard time finding affordable, adequate housing for themselves. And we define that as um, people being able to uh, pay uh, no more than 30% of their income in rent. We have way too many people in New York State and New York City in particular who are paying upwards to 40, 50, 60%, if not more, of their of their income in rent. And so when that's the case, uh, it's hard to it's hard to really uh, um, to to really survive and, and and thrive in our economy. And so one of the things we wanted to make sure was that our rental laws uh, sort of provided uh, protections and 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 were and were uh, ones that renters could feel comfortable with. Wonderful. Um, that's um, that's so 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 incredibly important. Thank you. Um, thank you for high level running running us through that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, crucial crucial information and and steps forward for um, for the renters in New York City. I mean, especially considering they make up you know seventy plus percent of of the residents here. Um, so thank you, thank you, Senator, for for all of that work. One um, one segment um, and popular question that we get a lot a lot about is, um, uh, especially as as it relates to um, to the pandemic, is around evictions. So I, I wanted mm -hmm. to to start um, start with and, and address folks who are worried about staying in their current apartment, um, especially if their income's been impacted by the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. Senator, could you, um, I mean, I guess the, the blatant question is, can, can a landlord evict, um, a tenant if they don't pay rent? So the, the question is, can a landlord evict a tenant if they don't pay rent effective now? The answer is yes. The, if the question is, can a landlord evict a tenant who has been COVID impacted, who can't pay rent, the answer is supposed to be no, okay? So until the, the governor has extended the eviction moratorium until August 22nd for those who are COVID impacted. And then the obvious question becomes, what is COVID impacted? And uh, that is something that when um, the governor provided an executive order, there was not a lot of specificity that was provided on that. I believe the, the premise that's gonna ultimately play itself out, which I'm sure has already started, is, is that as people are brought to um, uh, uh, court by, by landlords for, for non-payment of rent, their defense will, 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 will be that um, COVID was the, answer, was the reason for that. And in mm. those cases, the judge is supposed to provide uh, uh, a statement to those individuals. Now, what, what we have heard, what I at least have heard tangentially is that there are a number of conversations that are supposed to be going on. I'm not an expert on this because I don't. I'm not in this space where uh, landlords uh, have been working with tenants over the number of months on, you know, sort of COVID 
plans and 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 obviously that's an informal process not a thorough not a not a clean process it's something that we do in my opinion need to clean up uh, to be frank with you uh but uh as of right now uh, no one is supposed to be impacted who has had a who has been impacted by COVID, and that's uh, in terms of losing losing significant income, uh, you know, uh, and, and and other issues. And so it's it, it's not specified, um, but uh -huh. but the understanding that we have is that that um, uh, courts are, uh, are not to invict, uh, not to not to uh, proceed with cases where where COVID impacted patients are I'm mean, not patients are COVID impacted uh, uh -huh. constituents. Are 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 are, are, are being uh, evicted. Great. Okay. Thanks, Senator. And that that makes me um kind of now I'm also thinking about um folks that are you know maybe their their income was not directly impacted by um by COVID or maybe it was um but they're thinking about either resigning resigning the lease um or mm -hmm. new lease. Um, and maybe Mike, this is this is probably better, uh, might be better suited for you. But curious if landlord, if you know if landlords are more willing to negotiate on on a on a current lease right now. Yeah, absolutely. And to echo what some of the things that Brian the Senator said, which is spot on, is um, there's my honest opinion is is that you need to keep an honest dialogue with your landlord. So you know we don't want always to have things to go to legal court issues if they can be resolved prior to so if you are losing if you are showing lost wages and that's the reason why you go to your landlord and ask for a reduction in your rent i think that you should absolutely show them the proof so if for example if your wage was decreased by 20 percent of what you were making when the landlord accepted you as a tenant to have that dialogue with them and explain to them your situation and be open and honest, I think is the best way to have them be reasonable and to work with you. And if the situation is where you're looking to get a rent reduction or if you're gonna renew your lease, I think it's very important to do some research. So for example, if you live in an apartment building that you're 4A and the exact same apartment on 10A came in your building and you were paying, you know, 3000 a month and that run is on the market for 2500, mm -hmm. you know, use these things as a guideline. Go on Street Easy and look up the apartment building, do your homework, look at your building, see where the rents are and if it is justifiable, you should, you know, have that conversation and if especially if you're renewing a lease and you're consistent with your payments, you're a good tenant, you have no complaints filed against you and the last thing landlords want, especially in a tough market, is turnover, is people leaving. So if you can reach out to them and say, look, I, I live in 4A and I'm paying this, and I saw in the building that 10A came up and it's substantially less, I think, because I'm a good tenant, that I should have the ability to negotiate that as well. And especially with everything going on, this is the kind of time where landlords will be more reasonable, as opposed to a much more yeah. difficult market where they have the ability to say, okay, well, if you're gonna leave, we'll just bring somebody else in. It's it's not the case now. So I definitely think to do your research and, and have an open and honest dialogue with your landlord will always work the best. Great. And so so there's the, the eviction moratorium in place, um, incur encouraged conversations to have, um, or encouraging uh, to have conversations with uh, with your landlord. Um, and some, something else is also, um, I know there's financial assistance programs out there. Um, yeah. and Senator, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit, uh, a little bit about some renter assistance programs for, for prospective renters or, or current renters as well. Sure. So we passed, um, very recently a, a, a rental assistance relief bill that would provide a hundred million dollars. Of assistance to renters uh, again who um, who uh, were COVID impacted. These these are funds that would have to be applied for. They'd be administered by the Department of Housing Community uh, Housing Community Renewal. Uh, we passed the bill a couple weeks ago. The governor just signed it, and I know HCR is in the process of putting together uh, the uh, uh, procedures for how people uh, can apply. And 
clearly the, 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 the thought that they're looking at is how, is how to make that $100 million stretch. Obviously, we would like to have more money come in. Um, you know, we have been actively fighting for this federal government to, to provide assistance uh, to New York State. I mean, right now, the state is about $13 billion in the hole on a revenue perspective, and the city is about eight. And that's, and that's you know, optimistic. So it, it couldn't easily be much, much worse. Uh, and so what we have said is, well, let's, let's come up with this. There's something that we can provide. We put, put the $100 million on the table, and the process has to, um, is going to be rolling out. My office, and I'm sure other political offices, and I'm sure uh, Mike uh, will know this as well. I'm not sure exactly uh, if you deal with these issues, Mike, but uh, there will, you know, you, you, you want to know the best way to sort of reach out and access these funds and, and, and try to apply. My office will be providing my, my district with this, with all the information uh, 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 once it's once it's available, but there will be that money available. Uh, the I'm hearing off the, you know, I'm hearing early on that they're looking for that to be the bridge between whatever income people used to make and and, and whatever loss in income they have, trying to provide people with assistance to make them whole from whatever the deltas are that these people, uh, these folks have, have experienced. And so that's coming down the pipe soon. Um, uh, uh, and it's specifically COVID related. But, you know, COVID is hurting us across the board because at a time when we want to provide more assistance to people, the whole state is feeling the impact, right? So businesses were shut down, revenues are down, sales taxes are down, uh, property tax revenues are going to be down. Every All revenues are down because of the, the restrained economic activity. And at the same time, we have people who are in so much pain as a result of what has occurred. So we're, so we're trying to figure it out uh, to the best of our ability. Yes, and I appreciate uh, it is uh, it is um, no easy feat. Um, I I uh, I can only I can only imagine, or I mean I don't think I can imagine actually. Um, but so I mean you mentioned the future things coming, um, which I'd I'd like to as as best as we can do a little bit of a of a crystal ball, um, an actual crystal ball before we head into audience Q and A. Um, and, and head, head into the next topic briefly, um, which is preparing for post, post COVID. If there really ever is going to be a post COVID, I think, um, there are going to be a lot of new normals for us regardless. Um, but curious, um, to get either, either of your thoughts, um, Senator, maybe we can start with you, but what, what should New Yorkers expect the the real estate market to look like as we move into phase three phase four or is it kind of too too soon well i'm going to defer to michael on that question but what i uh, okay. but what i do think but what i do think just you know because i'm i'm not a i'm not a specialist on how the real estate market works but what i do think is going to be extraordinarily important that guides the the, the whole conversation in the context is going to be how what are our numbers? I mean, are we? Is New York going to continue having low, uh, 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 low COVID um, um, impact in terms of the amount of people who are dying, hospitalization, et cetera? Or are we going to look more like uh, South Carolina and Texas and some other states that have that have seen their numbers going in the wrong direction? So I think you know we can easily we can easily be in a situation where we have to, where we reopen and we have to close. I mean, we just saw the governor uh, along with. Um, um, uh, Connecticut and New Jersey issue a travel advisory um, saying that if you are from certain certain states and you come to New York, there's a required 14-day uh, uh, um, uh, uh, quarantine. That's because we're concerned about uh, COVID um, really coming back in a, in a serious way uh, here in New York. And if that happens, that's going to have a significant impact. You, you just saw the stock market yesterday uh, have a very serious uh, 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 sort of retraction because of fears that um, we're going to have to sort of turn back the clock. So I, I think the, the first and most important issue is for people to not get comfortable and not think that just because things have been looking good in New York um, over the last couple of weeks as it relates to this, that, that means we're, 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 we're off the hook. We can easily go back in the wrong direction. And so I think we need to be uh, all diligent, wearing our masks, uh, being careful as the economy is re, uh, reopening. That, that's, that's the time when we have to be very diligent and, and, and careful to keep 
uh, our numbers low. Because if a number a number's going the wrong direction, then we're going to have to revisit some of the some of the uh, uh, restrictive behaviors that is not good for the economy and not good for real estate or anything else. Yep. Um, ab absolutely. I do not want to revert all of this hard work that everybody has done over the last. <laughs> Of the last couple of months, um, Mike. Uh, Mike, if you if you wanted to to touch on your thoughts on what to expect as um, as the reopening phases kind of roll. So um, I, I it's so interesting. We were literally talking about the traveling, the restrictions of people coming in from out of state to New York right be uh, before the uh, actual webinar started. So Senator, I thought that was very interesting as well. And it is good to see that. So the tri-state is 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 exercising proper precautions, but to kind of echo what Senator uh, Brian said is it, it's so hard to know if the numbers will if they'll spike again. Uh, I think that we just have to be very very persistent with keeping masks on, taking these proper precautions. Uh, we are seeing things starting to get a little bit of some type of normalcy, but with the the way that this virus works, it really is so difficult to make a, a bold prediction saying, oh, the market's going to come back this fast. It's it's all going to be a slow process. I think it's going to take a, a long time for it to get back to some type of, of real normal. And I think we just need to every day just follow the precautions and keep informed and make sure that you know, if we are seeing spikes, because things can shut down right away too, and, and it's hard to say, oh, it's going to get normal, and then we have a spike in cases, because as we've seen, you know, how the governor has been responding to this, is, is he's being very, very, very proactive. So I, I can't crystal ball, like you said, say that it's going to get better soon. Uh, as long as we continue to do what New York is doing, and New York is persistent, and we listen, which is my favorite part about this city, we're resilient, and I, I'm looking at it with an optimistic lens, but I do err on the side of caution with uh, similar to what the senator has said. Great. Can I just add that real quick? Yeah, of course. Quick, I, think, I, think it, I think it's not to be underestimated the point that you just made, which is about the governor's proactiveness, right? I mean, the, the governor's been very clear, and I'm going to tell you why that's relevant in a second. The governor's been very clear that, you know, if we're seeing restaurants behaving appropriately, we're going to pull the liquor license, right? If, and, and, I, and I think that's going to apply across the, the economy, and I think as you think about real estate, particularly, I mean, just the just the process of trying to get an apartment, there's a lot of touching that's going on. You're touching doors. You're you're, you're probably touching people. Hopefully, you're not. But you know, that's a that's an intimate process. You can't really zoom that process not too much. I'm sure you can you can sort of survey and all that, but you still got to move and and you got to and then there's all those act activities. If we start seeing clusters of problems. That's going to have real impact and concern and, and uh, for the for the community because the the governor has been very clear he will step in and shut business down in order to keep everyone safe. So I I just want to re-echo that point. We don't have a governor who doesn't think COVID is a real issue. We we have someone who believes in science and data. Um, a number of us in legislature support him in that. So you know we just got to make sure that all the actions that are occurring on the on the private uh, side. Uh, are, are, are safe so that we don't move in the wrong direction. Absolutely. And I mean, um, you know, uh, uh, fascinating s silver, I mean, silver lining um, to all of this, and especially in the real estate space, is the amount of virtual tours that uh, and tools that have popped up. So, I mean, it, it seems like as we continue to be diligent about safety and um, and health that being able to continue to leverage virtual options and virtual tours and really save the in-person for something um, something really, really necessary and, and ready to move, which also means you're relying probably on the agent um, a, a little bit more too, asking those questions and getting as much information as possible before you take that, that in-person step. I agree. Um, and there was one thing I did want to say about that. If you are going to be viewing apartments virtually, there are a few little tips and tricks that you should do. First and foremost, have the agent show you the entire building, not just the unit. Have them look at the basement, check the cleanliness of the basement, because the basement of the building, it's this is New York City, the buildings are older. It's very indicative of how the overall building is run. 
protect the proximity of the entrance of your apartment to the elevators, to the waste disposal. And also when you're having the virtual tour, have the agent or the landlord open that window, gauge the noise from the outside. These are all things that, you know, real estate agents like to take pretty photos, but you got to do those little things too, because you never know what you're getting yourself into. So I wanted to make sure that was, that was made abundantly clear. <laughs> Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and uh, I know I know we're we're coming coming up on time, um, but that actually hit um, the virtual tour tips did did hit a um, uh, uh, selection of our um, of our audience Q and A. But let's actually um, in the time we have left, and if everybody listening will stay on with me for just a couple minutes over, um, we'll we'll get um, we'll get to Q and A. Nancy, come on. Um, Come back on for us, um, but I wanted to uh, a pop a popular theme um, from audience Q and A um, is uh, is on negotiating. Um, so, what's an appropriate tool to counter um, both on the uh, for the actual asking rent, but also for broker fees? Mike, if you want to take that. Well, one thing I don't like to do is negotiate my fee, but listen, it's <laughs> New York City is the only city that I know that charges up to 15% of the annual rent. And for a rental that is extremely expensive. So my advice, if you are going to negotiate on the, the price of the rental and as far as the uh, broker fee as well, my best advice, if you're going to negotiate on the rent for a property is to have all of your ducks in a row to show that you're a very qualified and quality tenant. So that means have all of your paperwork. So when you're renting an apartment in New York, they need your driver's license, the first two pages of your tax returns to show that you meet that minimum requirement, which in New York City is typically 40 times the monthly rent. Um, you also need to have your pay stubs, a copy of your bank account. If you have all of these things ready, me as an agent who represents landlords, I look at this and I get something that's given to me basically tied up in a pretty bow and says, I'm a very qualified tenant. Here's all of my paperwork. I'm ready to sign a lease tomorrow. However, I don't want to pay this price. I'll pay 200 off the lease. And they'll look at that and they'll say, look, okay, this person's qualified. This person makes a good amount of money that makes, you know, makes me comfortable and they're organized. Why would I take the chance of not having a quality tenant over trying to get a couple of hundred dollars extra off, off of what they were asking initially? So that's my number one. Um, when it comes to a broker fee, it's, I, I agree with the same thing that I just said, have all of your ducks in a row, have everything ready to go and say, look, You've got me here. I'm perfect. I want this place, but I'm not paying that 15%, especially if there's not two brokers involved because it's a co-broker and they split. A little fun fact, if a broker, if you come in, and I shouldn't say this, but I will, you come in without a broker, typically they're much, much more willing to negotiate on that 15% than if you bring in another broker and now suddenly it's split in two. So I definitely recommend have all your paperwork ready, show them that you're the perfect tenant. And if they miss you, they're missing an opportunity to A, have the bills paid for the landlord and B, to have an apartment that will be taken care of and won't have as much you know, wear and tear if you have a quality tenant. So. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, there are, there are all, um, since we're, we're on the topic of broker fees, there are... Um, um, there are a, a set of questions ab about the the broker fee and um, it uh, the the ban that was talked about earlier in the year, but that's now um, that's now on pause. Senator, do you um, have any any updates on the on the broker fee policy or legislation that's um, um, that's that's out there that we can talk to renters yeah. about? No, I, I do not. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, 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 it's in court, and so I, I want to. We'll see how that plays itself out. But I, but I do, um, I do want to do want to mention that I do think it's important that I almost feel like a lawyer should be. People if they have someone who understands tenant law is is helpful. Mm -hmm. and I know I'm not trying to, you know, subscribe to that, but this because there's so many things that we pass, so so many different issues, you know, whether it's in court or not. And I don't know how you feel about this, uh, Mike, um, but 
it just feels like to me, you know, uh, as someone who was part of passing all the laws, I forget half the laws we pass uh, sometimes, right? I mean, the limit, the limitations on late fees, uh, you know, you only can, you know, the security deposit, all these different issues. I think, you know, people being informed and knowledgeable is, is, the, is the most important thing. And I think being organized, as Mike said, is, you know, I, I, would, I, would, I would definitely organ, uh, focus on that as well. Yeah. And are there, are, are there, um, you know, the, the go-to resources for um, staying on top of what's, um, what's passed um, that, that you recommend, Senator? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, we do, we do our I best, do, that's we that's do our best on Street Easy to make sure we have, we have an, we do have an ongoing running list of, of updates. So we, we, we do our best to keep on top, but curious if you have, you have anything. Yeah, I think I think you know the DHCR website is a good one. I know the Housing Justice for All um, uh, a website. That's a group that was very active on tenant reform. They they have uh, information legal aid society. Those are the kinds of groups that who keep that information live. I honestly get a lot of my information from my council and and my so mm -hmm. I, I, I I'm not normally a consumer externally. Um, so I don't sure. uh, so, so I don't. I'm not, I'm an expert on where those come, but the groups that were very active in us getting the rent laws passed, uh, they, they, they are carrying a lot of that. Great. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, the, I wanted to ad address some questions about breaking, breaking leases. Um, and if that's possible during this time, um, I don't know, Mike, if, if you have thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I have experienced several of my clients in larger spaces that are looking to break their lease and go to the suburbs. Uh, obvious reasons, they're just you know nervous about being in New York City. And the honest answer to that is every landlord's going to be different. I've had experiences with some landlords that you know they have a flat rate fee. For example, in my building, if you are to break a lease, they charge you fifteen hundred dollars. And you know that it's it's a hefty bill to pay to have to be evicted. Now I don't know the legalities if it's because you lost work or wages due to COVID. Too tough to answer. But for some other instances, and and this is where I go back to what I said earlier with have an open dialogue with your landlord because you can always have. I've had situations where I've had my client reach out to their landlord and say, listen you know, X, Y, and Z is happening. And because of this, I can't afford to stay here or I need to leave. And they give the landlord access to show the apartment to find a replacement at that same price. So the landlord doesn't feel like they're losing anything. And they, you know, if they're using a real estate broker, you know, tell the landlord, I will let the broker come in and show the property. And you can show, you know, during these windows, and if they, you know, sign the lease, then that takes you off the hook. And that's my best advice. It's very case by case, but typically the most important thing to the landlord is one, the rent is paid, and two, the apartment is still standing. So if you can have the broker go in and show the apartment to some potential other tenants while you're still living there, and even try to upsell it. Say, look, I'm an interior, this literally happened to me yesterday. I'm an interior designer. The apartment looks like it's professionally staged. You might get more money, and turns out she did. So it actually, you know, it's, you gotta play every card, but as long as you're transparent and you, you go with people with, um, with, with trying to help and not just trying to, to get out of things, I think it always plays in your favor, for sure. Great. And yeah, I, let, let me just, can I say oh, something real quick on that? Really quick of that. course. Um, in, the, in the housing laws that we passed, one of the key provisions that was in there was that a landlord must make a good faith effort to re-rent if a tenant breaks the lease. And if they are able to re-rent that apartment, then they must reduce damages accordingly. So that we don't in the law we passed last year you can't a, a landlord can't double dip and basically have you re-rent the apartment but you still have to pay full damages and they're getting they're getting sort of double um double benefits on that so um i agree with mike entirely uh because at least what we have in law there, there has to be a, re a reduction in damages if the um if, if if the apartment is re is re-rented before the end of the lease term that's a great point yeah, I, I actually forgot that that was passed, and it's 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 important because 
historically landlords can in New York they can get away with a lot and they could keep your deposit and take this and then get a new tenant and get a full you know full rent for that month so I think that that was a really good piece of legislation that passed and and it's only good for New York tenants which you know it, it's an expensive city I'm being staying, staying cognizant of everyone's time uh, for our, our, our panelists, but uh, but also our, our audience. Thanks for sticking over with us. Um, uh, before I wrap up, any closing closing remarks from from you, Senator? I just want to reiterate reiterate what I said a little earlier that it's a very complicated process. I think you need to have a great broker. It sounds to me like Mike's a really good one from what I'm hearing. Uh, but you got to have a great broker, and I think you need to be as informed as you can be on the law and what's going on, and, and make sure that you're not being taken advantage of as you're looking to find uh, uh, your apartment. But I love New York City. It's a great place to live. There's a lot going on here. Uh, very culturally diverse. I know, you know, we, we, we got our arms around COVID, thank God. And I, I want to make sure that people feel like this is a good place to call home and raise their families. So anything we could do. Street easy and others to make that happen. I'm I'm all for it. I I don't think there's there's a there's a better way to end on uh end on than that. Um so Nancy, Nancy, Mike, yeah, and and the senator as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you everybody for tuning in. We did not even scratch the surface. Um there's so much here, um, but I, I do really, really hope. Um, that this is at, at least a, a starting point for you um, to get, get your brains thinking uh, about preparing um, for for moving and, and renting in New York City um, and the abundance of information that's important, but also the resources that are available available to you. Um, also, I, I recognize there are a lot of a lot of questions that we didn't get to. We'll make sure to go through those and um, and do our best to to get back to you and Mike and Mike and Nancy and maybe the senator uh, might might throw a couple offline questions your way for help. Um, but thank you, thank you so so much for your time, everybody for tuning in. Um, this will be uh, a recording of this will be sent around, um, and we hope to catch you um, at at a future webinar. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. So much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.